Hi everyone, I'm Andy, um, and the timer is in my pocket right now, so I'll be comfortable. Um, we're going to talk about secrets of Plesk engineering team. Uh, look behind the scenes and best outtakes. So uh, since I have the luxury of kind of stretching my talk a bit due to the timer in my pocket, uh, I would try to speak a bit slower because I know not everybody has English as their first language and I would like everybody to be on the same page and un understand all the stuff that we're going to talk about. Right, so um, a bit about myself. My name is Andy. I'm a senior program manager in Plusk. I've been in Plusk for 14 years same time in the hosting industry. I've been using WordPress for 12 years, and as Jan has mentioned, I'm the product owner and daddy of WordPress Toolkit. I've been there from day zero, actually talking to my management and asking them to focus on that and trying to do something like that. And I remember they were a bit skeptical at first, but here we are. So, Today, I'm going to talk a bit about what happens behind the scenes of Plask development. What makes the cut, what doesn't, and why. I am also going to talk about the logic behind our decision making in research and development. I hope this short session uh, will lift the veil, so to say, from the development process of Plask itself and also, the same principles will apply to our own Plusk extensions, the ones that Jan has mentioned, like WordPress Toolkit, Advanced Monitoring, Grafana, Composer. They all work the same way. So, Plusk Obsidian is conquering the box office as we speak, and it would be really strange to not use it as the main example for our session. Let's go through some numbers on Plesk Obsidian. It's been in development for 18 months. We have fixed 1,911 bugs. We have drank 27,375 20, liters of coffee, according to the stats by our own well, coffee machine in the office, right? We have implemented 535 user stories, which is, if you don't know, the dev lingo is like a small feature or improvement or a part of a bigger feature, right? And we had used a lot of curse words during the development, especially when we're fixing the bugs. <laughs> so, 3 million something point seven, don't ask. Uh, and I've already had questions about this. Were these the unique curse words where they were repeating somewhat? We're not that good, right? We had to repeat some or had to invent some, right? So, speaking of numbers, let's talk about how numbers drive our decisions. We're sometimes asked why some feature requests and bug fixes take so long to be addressed. And a lot of them are still in the backlog. Are they not important? The thing is, they are important. It's just that other things are even more important. To put things in perspective, we have a huge, huge number of feature requests from customers, and that's not counting our own internal ideas. For example, right now, well, a couple of days ago, uh, we have almost 1,500 open feature requests on our user voice, public system that we use for tracking ideas. It is, as you understand, impossible to implement all of that, right? And they keep coming, actually. We close them. We close one. Ten more keep, keep coming. You know, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> so analyzing and prioritizing all these things is one of the most important, and I would say one of the most challenging aspects of our job in R&D. So how do we do it? Well, 
The key element here is usage stats, which is popularity. Usage stats are one of the most important, the key elements in our decision making that allow us to focus on the important stuff. For example, I've mentioned the WordPress toolkit and that I was at ground zero when it began. So our decision to create WordPress toolkit back in 2014 was based on the fact that 80% roughly of all applications in Blask from our APS catalog, which stored all the applications that we provided to customers, were WordPress. So that's hundreds of thousands of sites. And we're talking about only APS apps. That doesn't count the WordPress sites installed manually without the APS catalog, right? So everything else, as you can see on the graph, and that's an internal graph, uh, was not even close then. And the gap is actually getting bigger as we speak right now. Here is another example. We really like Cloud Linux. We actually really do. And we support it the way we support all other Linux and Windows distributions. Full support, bug fixes, everything. But sometimes we get requests for really specific bug fixes or really specific Cloud Linux only feature requests. And it's hard to prioritize this when it comprises 1% of our installation base. Would you do something for 1% of your user base if you knew it wouldn't give you any extra revenue? That's a good question. Sometimes we do, sometimes we have to skip on that. Similarly, on WordPress Toolkit side, there's a question about multi-site support that I get sometimes. But when I look at usage stats, these are the stats. The blue one is total amount of WordPress sites. And that small yellow thingy is multi-sites. When I look at the stats to decide whether we should put more, uh, you know, what my team should focus on, the WordPress Toolkit team, it's very hard to argue to spend our limited development efforts on you know, WordPress multi-site support. Even though 1% of sites is still a huge number in absolute you know, numbers, right? Uh, we, were, we would rather focus on the stuff that the majority of people needs, right? Uh, and we have a lot of requests and our own internal ideas uh, that could make life better for the majority of users, not just 1% of them. Uh, features and feature requests are not the only thing we have to deal with. We have to address the issues too. The bugs, the spiders, all that kind of stuff. Bugs are expected. They are inevitable part of software development process, no matter what the software is. And before you decide what to do with them, you have to find them. We have a pretty extensive QA team constantly doing a lot of testing, often with help of developers, often with other people. Like I do some testing as well to help everybody out on the team. Unit testing, automated testing, regression testing, end-to-end -end testing, smoke testing. You've heard it, we've probably got it. Uh, the majority of issues are actually found internally and handled before getting to the customers. They don't even make the release notes the majority of time. The bug list you see in our release notes, like this is the screenshot from WordPress Toolkit, is actually a relatively small percentage of the issues that uh, we fix in the development cycle. Once the product gets to the customers, we don't actually wait for bug reports. If a Plusk server encounters an error, it reports this error to our internal service. The errors are collected and uh, grouped so we can actually see how many times certain error happened and on how many servers. This allows us to proactively analyze how our products work on production servers 
and release fixes without waiting for the customers to encounter the issue. There has been a lot of times when we found the issue basically the same day it happened after the release and release the hotfix next day before customers could actually encounter the issue. This tool really helps us understand and fight the issues. It helps us understand which versions of Plesk are affected, how many servers are reporting the issue, and how often the issue actually happens. Because it can happen multiple times on the same server, a recurrent thing. Even though we have all these things, the testing, the reporting, we're still really, really careful about introducing the changes. That's why we have a special tool for that. It's called Leica. I'm sure most of my non-Russian colleagues are wondering why I am showing you all a picture of a watering can. That's because Leica means watering can in Russia. I know this because I named the service. So the point of Leica, this service, is relatively simple. We roll out a particular change, a small dose of water, like in a watering can, to a small audience. We look at data, how the, how the change performs. Is it causing any issues? And then we make a decision. Is it safe to actually enable this feature improvement, something, a bug fix, for the whole audience? Or we should use this Leica service to roll back the changes and start from fresh? Uh, this approach is actually uh, industry standard today. Facebook, Google, Booking, any service you're using is actually uses this approach, right? Uh, so, and it's understandable because it brings a lot of benefits to both the software vendor and to the end customers as well. Uh, this service, together with all our other services, tools and processes, uh, some of which I have mentioned before, uh, has allowed us to make arguably the biggest change in Plask ever, even if it's not visible on the surface. And I'm talking about this new Plask release pipeline, which is something Jan mentioned as well. As you know, and you know because you've heard it what, 20 minutes ago, right? <laughs> Even if you haven't heard it before. Uh, we have switched from yearly large Blesk releases to a quicker cycle of shorter monthly releases. This required us to dramatically change how we develop and deliver our product. We had to create a completely new CI, CD pipeline that is in Tech Talk, continuous integration and continuous delivery to make sure that every single change our developers are doing, and not only developers, anybody who works on Plask code, anything that is introduced in Plask, bug fix, text label change, a new feature is carefully and automatically tested before ending up in the production build. This allows us to almost always have a build, a product build that can be packaged and deployed to you, the customers, to the whole world, all operating systems and everything in a matter of a day. Maybe not hours, some in s maybe hours in some cases. And this dramatically shortens our response time and time to market for hot features. But Andy, I don't want to have a mini release every month, you know, some people might say. Uh, I hear you, but it's not going to be like that. Here's the important part. You're not going to have a huge, life-changing, uh, dramatic release every month. No. You're going to have relatively small, non-dramatic changes. Gradual. You're going to get stuff you need quicker. You need new operating system support. You don't have to wait a year for a new major product release. Uh, you need a small but really critical feature. We can deliver it in a month or two. And speaking of requesting features, even though we rely on numbers a lot, it doesn't mean we're not listening to our customers. Take a look at this. 
We have closed more than twice the amount of customer feature requests that's based on user voice requests in the initial release of Plesk Obsidian compared to the latest version of Plesk Onyx 17.8. Uh, we have implemented absolute top, most popular customer requests, like for example, move domains between subscriptions feature. Finally, it has, it had like absolute record in terms of votes on the user voice. And it's available in Plesk Obsidian right now. Another example is the ability to notify customers through email when their mailbox quota is exceeded. Another really important, really popular feature requests. And as you understand, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The customers also help in other ways. For example, we have been improving various defaults in Plesk, that is default settings for the services and so on and so on, for quite some time to make sure that people don't need to spend a lot of time working on configuring their server after the installation. After all, if we in Plesk can pre-configure some of the stuff, why not do it immediately without waiting for you? The interesting thing about these defaults is that we have been basing these changes on multiple customer interviews and actual partner scripts shared with us. So we're not simply trying to imagine what would hoster do when they get their hands on a new Plesk server. We can actually look at the production scripts used by actual hosters who shared that with us too because they knew it would help them in the long run. Uh, and we can make sure that these defaults that we change are applied to everybody, especially those who have shared the scripts, right? Because we're basing that on their defaults. They will be definitely happy. Here's another, m even more interesting cases. Our customers have been asking us for mail SNI support, specifically SNI server name indication support in Postfix, most popular mail server used in Plesk. They've been asking that for quite some time, but Postfix didn't have it, and it's not our software. We're just using it, right? It's not like we can do anything about that, or can we? Well, we have contacted the developers of Postfix with the body of evidence, so to say, that is a pile of your requests and other data, like market trends and stuff like that, and convince them to add SNI support to their product for you. So starting with Postfix 3.4, you have got your SNI support in Plask. And same thing happened with Mail Enable for those who have Windows hosting. Um, Moreover, we have helped both these teams, Postfix and Mail Enable, to actually debug their product because we know our customers, we know the scenarios, we are in close contact with you. So with your help, we actually helped the Postfix team and Mail Enable team to bring that feature over to the whole world. I'm telling you these examples uh, to show you that your voices matter. And sometimes they matter more than you think. Uh, you should keep in mind that you know there are other quite powerful forces uh, besides your voices, and we have to take them also into the account. So let's summarize the recipe, the Plesk R&D research and development recipe for coming up with a great release scenario. We take into account popularity and usage of certain things, put them into a pod. We estimate how expensive would be doing something in relation to the expected impact, put that into the pod. We need to take into account the performance and the security considerations, off they go into the same pod. Can we learn earn extra money from it? What about our customers? Can they upsell it to their customers? Goes into the pot as well. 
Are we going to have complications with another third-party integration? Need to throw a pinch of that into the pod. And obviously, there's this intangible bit of like gut feeling or intuition, which is basically a function of our compiled experience um, in the industry. It can sometimes make a good release script really great. Sometimes, even with all these things, there's no clear answer. Take WordPress Toolkit, uh, for example. We have multiple hosters who want to use WordPress Toolkit as a platform for their own managed WordPress hosting, as Jan has mentioned. But some of them are not sure they want a separate WordPress Toolkit installation on each Flask server. They're thinking that having a centralized service that manages WordPress sites on all their servers would be more convenient. But they're not sure, not always sure. Uh, should we go for it? Because even if they are sure, it's a hard trade-off for us. It's a trade-off that affects our users, including these hosters. WordPress Toolkit team is relatively small, as I have mentioned. So if we focus on something like that, like WordPress Toolkit standalone, it means we're not focusing on something else. And this includes long requested features like plugin and theme sets for sellers, ability to install these sets on an already existing WordPress site, WordPress Toolkit action logs for each WordPress site, hmm, ability to change site URL and UI, permanent attachment, and so on and so on. It doesn't mean we're not going to do that. We can actually do that in parallel, but we cannot do all of that in parallel because it's quite expensive if we do this undertaking. And believe me, we also have a lot of great, fantastic ideas internally about how to make WordPress toolkit even better. It's just that we cannot do everything at once, right? Our resources are limited, at least not, one, not, not at once. So finding ways to answer some of these questions uh, is something you're probably going to see in the upcoming sequels of our product, so to say. And if you have some ideas on that, how to balance these things, what's important, what's not, you can find me after this talk and I would love to hear what you think. As you see, there are a lot of factors behind the scenes that influence our decisions. The reality is probably even more complex than that to the point where some might say it's more magic than science, what we do. And I would love to talk about it some more, but our session has come to an end. And I hope it has been an interesting insight into our decision-making process. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking for you. And I hope I'm perfectly on time so that the next person can start their fantastic talk right on time. So if you have any questions, you're free to find me at this event, coffee break, and so on and so on. I would be happy to talk about this particular topic and WordPress Toolkit and Plask as well. So if you want to talk to somebody straight from r and I'm your guy. Thank you very much for your attention. I was happy to see so many smiling faces here. Thank you.